When we find a natural experiment, as opposed to running a randomized controlled experiment, we have to worry about the presence of confounders, things that cause the control group to be different than the treatment group. And then we have to have a strategy to adjust for the presence of those confounders in order to arrive at the average treatment effect that would have occurred had we been able to run a randomized controlled experiment. The strategies that we use to do that are called identification strategies, and they come out of the toolkit of econometrics. Now in class, we went over three types of identification strategies, and I want to briefly review those just to make sure that we're comfortable with them before we progress in the course. The first strategy we talked about was called difference in difference. And we focused on the increase in the minimum wage in New Jersey that happened in 1994, but wasn't accompanied by a similar increase in the minimum wage in neighboring Pennsylvania. David Card focused on the city of Philadelphia, because the city of Philadelphia has a state border running through it that separates the city partly into New Jersey and partly into Pennsylvania. So part of the city experienced an increase in the minimum wage, but the other part did not. So we have a treatment group, the part of the city that lies in New Jersey, and the control group, the part of the city that lies in Pennsylvania. But there's no particular reason to believe that the two parts of the city are identical in every way. There may be confounders that cause differences between the part of the city that lies in Pennsylvania, the control group, and the part of the city that lies in New Jersey, the treatment group. So we can't just compare the outcomes in New Jersey to the outcomes in Pennsylvania and say those outcomes must have been due to the increase in the minimum wage. But what we can do is focus on what changed between the time that the minimum wage was the same across the city and the time that it changed. The argument is that while the two parts of the city might be different in all sorts of ways, introducing confounders into the analysis, the city as a whole experienced the same economic trends from 1993 to 1994. So they start out different, they'll end up different, but the change they experienced from 1993 to 1994 was the same. So David Card went out and found how much employment there was in the average fast food restaurant in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania within the city of Philadelphia. And so these are the numbers that he found. In 1993, there were more average employees per fast food restaurant in Pennsylvania than in New Jersey, suggesting that there were in fact differences between the two parts of the city. Then, in 1994, after the introduction of the minimum wage, the increase in the minimum wage in New Jersey, he again went to those same restaurants and found that the average number of employees had changed in both places. So here we have a control group in Pennsylvania and a treatment group in New Jersey. And instead of focusing on the absolute numbers, we're focusing on the change in numbers because we believe that the city as a whole experienced the same overall changes. And therefore, we look at those changes over time. So we find that in Pennsylvania, the average number of employees for a fast food restaurant fell by 2.15 between 1993 and 1994. But it increased in New Jersey by 0 0.59. If Pennsylvania is a good control group, we can use the outcome in Pennsylvania to predict what would have happened in the treatment group had the treatment not taken place. So had the increase in the minimum wage on the New Jersey side not happened, we would expect a decrease in employment by about 2.15 in fast food restaurants in New Jersey, on the New Jersey side of Philadelphia. Instead, we saw an increase in 0.59 of average employees per fast food restaurant. So if we would have expected, because of the control group, to see a decline of 2.15, but we actually saw an increase of 0.59, we would conclude that compared to what we think would have happened, 
we saw an overall increase in employment in New Jersey by 2.74. The difference between these two numbers. So the analysis looked first at the change in employment, the difference in employment across the two years in both places. And then we took the difference in those differences to calculate what the average treatment effect was of the increase in the minimum wage in New Jersey. The second identification strategy we focused on was called boundary discontinuity. And we used as an example two school districts. And the question of whether the school quality in the school districts has an effect on housing price values. So we have an area with two school districts and a boundary that separates the houses between those school districts. Let's suppose that we have a better school in this district than we do in this district. So we have a treatment group, the school district that has the better school, and the control group, the school district that has a worse school. And we want to know whether the better school has an impact on housing values. So we could simply look at the average housing values in this district and the average housing values in this district and see if they're different. But there's no reason to think that there's randomness into the control group and the treatment group. There's no reason to think that the characteristics of the control group are the same as in the treatment group. There may be all sorts of things that are different between the two districts. It may be that this district has a lower crime rate or more accessibility to public parks. So just looking at the difference in average house prices would be not adjusting for the confounders that are presence, present in this natural experiment. Instead, we look at the boundary between those two districts. There's a street that forms the boundary and we look at houses that lie on that street. There's no reason to think that those other things, those confounders we worry about, are present along that street. Burglars don't care which side of the street the house is on, so the crime rates are probably exactly the same for houses on one side of the street versus houses on the other side of the street. Houses on this street have the same access to the same public parks because they're on the same street. So we've gotten rid of the confounders by focusing just on the boundary and then comparing the average price of houses on one side of the street that have access to this public school to the price of houses on the other side of the street that have access to that public school. We now can argue that the only thing that's different between these houses is the treatment of the better public school on this side versus the worse public school on this side. So again, we have a strategy to take care of the presence of confounders, but in this case, we're focusing on the boundary, and we call that strategy the boundary discontinuity strategy. Finally, we talked about what's called propensity score matching. And we talked in particular about the impact of preschools on child outcomes. So the question is, does going to preschool cause children to do better or worse in school? Do they score better or worse on tests? Are they more likely to graduate? Things of that sort. Is there a causal impact of the treatment of preschool? Well, we could simply look at those kids who go to preschool and compare them to the kids who don't go to preschool. We have a treatment group and a control group. But are there confounders present? Well, it may be that the families who send their children to preschool are different in all sorts of ways from the families who don't send their children to preschool. So we have to think about how can we adjust for the presence of those confounders. And one method is to do what's called propensity score matching. Under propensity score matching, we only compare households that are similar in all the observable ways that we can imagine. We can compare the outcomes of children who go to preschool and those who don't go to preschool from two parent families that have similar income, 
similar levels of education of parents and so forth. And if we only compare like to like, if we've adjusted for all the possible differences between the two households, and the only difference that remains is that one sent their kid to preschool and the other did not, we would argue that we've adjusted for the presence of confounders and are truly focusing only on the causal effect of preschool on child outcomes. But we also mentioned that economists are somewhat skeptical of this approach. Because after all, if we have two families that look identical in every way, but one family sent their kid to preschool and the other one did not, there's a question of what caused that difference in behavior. There must have been something that we're not observing that's different about those two families. And that, whatever it is, might be a confounder that remains in the analysis. So if all we can do is match on observable characteristics, we may still worry that there are unobservable confounders that we haven't adjusted for. So the only way we can be confident in propensity score matching is if we think we have so many observable characteristics that we've really covered all of our bases, that we really are comparing like to like, and we don't have to be worried about, about unobserved differences between the families that we're comparing.